Lesson, lesson 2, Representing Data. As with so many of our lessons in AP Computer Science Principles, this is an interactive lesson. So simply viewing it online, you will get something out of it, but it's really meant to be done with other people. So um, to the best of my ability, I will represent it here. But again, best to be in person. First off, in this lesson, you're going to create a device for sending a single bit of information over some distance. You're going to analyze the possibilities and limitations that arise when sending binary messages, and we're going to define what a binary message is. And then you should be able to explain or demonstrate how to use a binary message sending device in order to send messages that have more than two states. First, we're going to watch Crash Course 2 Electronic Computing. And I'm not going to play this for you here because it's a separate video, and you can go and play that video. If you're doing this all online through the Canvas um, learning system, then simply click on the Crash Course Electronic Computing. I also placed notes out there that you can use to fill in. You may print them off and fill them in. You don't have to. You could just take notes on your own or remember what's in the video. It's all entirely up to you. But at this point, if you haven't watched Crash Course 2 Electronic Computing, please go and do that now. You're back. Let's go over the notes. Now again, this is whether you printed them off or you're just going to write them down here. This is picking out the primary, the major points in the video. First off, one of the largest electromechanical computers built was the Harvard Mark I. This was completed in 1944 by IBM for the Allies during World War II. Remember, wartime it just tends to prompt a lot of um, innovation, okay? Everybody's trying to get the latest and the greatest and the best thing to set them apart and put them in front. So in 1944, the Harvard Mark I was created by IBM, International Business Machines, for the Allies during World War II. One of its earliest uses for this technology was running simulations for the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the atomic bomb. Now, what is a relay and how, is, how does it work and what is it similar to? Rela relays oops, are electronically controlled mechanical switches. So it's controlled by electricity, but it's a mechanical switch. There's a control wire that, that determines whether the circuit is open or closed. The control wire connects to a coil of wire inside the relay. And when current flows through the coil, that electromagnetic field is created, which attracts a metal arm inside the relay to snap shut, completing the circuit, similar to a water faucet. Okay? So it's electromechanical, which electricity runs through it, but it's an actual mechanical device. So in addition to it sometimes being very slow, there was wear and tear on those switches, the mechanical arms. Now, where did we get the term computer bug? Ah, uh, it was an actual bug. The Harvard Mark II had a moth in it, which was causing problems. And Grace Hopper, which is a famous man, famous computer scientist, um, one of the very first programmers ever, was the one to coin the term a bug, computer bug. Now, in 1904, going back even farther, English physicist John Ambrose Fleming developed a new electrical component called this is a crazy one, it's hard to spell, thermionic, thermionic valve. It housed two electrodes and an airtight glass bulb. Airtight. This was your first vacuum tube. Triode vacuum tubes would become the basis for radio, long distance telephone, and many other electronic devices for nearly a half century. Vacuum tubes, it was the end all be all. Um, it was how things communicated. The first large-scale use of vacuum tubes for computing was the Colossus Mark I, designed by an engineer named Tommy Flowers, and it was completed in December of 1943. It is regarded as the first programmable electronic computer. 
Um, there were computers before, but they did a single thing. You couldn't program it to do something else. A transistor. It's like a relay or a vacuum tube. It's a switch that can be opened or closed by applying electrical power via a control wire. Typically, you have two electrodes separated by material that sometimes can conduct electricity and other times resist it. Current can flow or be stopped by a gate electrode. Okay, so it's similar to a relay or vacuum tube. A lot of transistor and semiconductor development happened in the Santa Clara Valley between San Francisco and San Jose, California. As the most common material used to create semiconductors is silicon, this region soon became known as Silicon Valley. And that was the crux of the video. And these are your notes. So again, if you printed them out and you want to fill them in, great. If you just took down the notes, that's fine too. Now, computer science is often thought of as the study of computers themselves. The physical machines we have on our desks or those crazy cell phones or tablets that we carry around in our pockets or backpacks. Another way to think about computer science is the study of information and information processes. Now, what I want you to do is pause the video and respond to this prompt. What other words come to mind when you hear the word information? So pause the video and jot down some of those words. Okay, now, now that you're back, you can think about lots of other things that might be information, okay? It could be data, it could be, oh, so many things. Um, and if, and what I really don't want to do is give you everything, I would like for you to be part of the class. If you watch the, um, the video of the recorded lesson. In class, I will be asking people for their words. Now, at this point, again, in class, I would be asking students to discuss with their neighbors or I would be calling on them via Zoom. Many ways to think about the word information, but the one that we are going to explore today in more depth is that information is the answer to a question. Binary question. This is the simplest type of question you can ask. A binary question has only two possible answers. Yes, no, true, false, either, or. You can think blue, green, up, down, left, right. A binary message will be a message with only one of two possible values. Now, if we're virtual, I will be assigning you partners because I have to set up your um, virtual rooms, your breakout rooms. If we're in person, then I would be assigning you a partner. Now you wanna imagine that you and your friend have not been able to communicate for the entire summer. And you have a chance now to ask him or her one binary question that he or she will answer. What binary question do you wanna ask? So just stop and think about what's something that you could ask somebody about their summer. Pause the video and write down what you might ask. Now that you have a binary question, let's talk about how to answer it. Answering a binary question is easy when we speak to each other, but it becomes more difficult when we are separated. Today, you're going to build a device that will send binary messages. The first challenge you have. The first challenge You'll have five minutes to construct a device out of supplies, and I have a bunch of them in class. I'm gonna talk about what you should have at home or think about. You don't actually have to build it if we're, when we're virtual. You need to think about it, discuss it, and figure out what you might try to do, okay? So you want to use supplies to send a simple binary message, one of the two possible answers to your question to your partner on the other side of the room. You should try to make it fail-proof. Consider obstacles that might be thrown in your way. Would your device still work if there was something in between you and your partner? What if you couldn't see your partner? Or you were in a very loud room? Or maybe your partner wasn't even paying attention. Now in virtual, I want you to think about how you can use everyday items, such as a whistle, 
a paper clip, a flashlight, a card with a different color on each side, a string, um, lots of different, anything household, a spoon, a fork. Okay, what I want you to do is with the person that you're paired up with, discuss how you could use that information or any combination of those items to communicate an answer to a binary question. Come up with your binary question and how would this new device that you're doing, how would it work and how would it answer the problems? Now, again, in class, I would start the timer. Virtually, you should take five minutes. This isn't supposed to be something that's, you're not being grand. The idea is to do a rapid kind of prototype of it. So pause the video and think about how could you use some everyday items to answer a yes, no question. Now, let's see what you came up with. Here, we're gonna help out with, we're gonna help each other out as each partnership that I call on virtually or in person presents their machine. I want everybody else to think about, is it simple? Are there times it will not work? Are there only two states? Is it truly binary? Now, do we have, my question was, do we have a, qu a quiz or a test today? Message A was quiz, message B would be a test. So A was one tug on the string, B was two quick tugs on the string. Now again, at this point in class, I would go around and check with everybody. The word for a single binary state is bit. In the curriculum, in the curriculum you will see the references to bits starting in the next lesson where the word is introduced. While typically bit refers to a zero or one, for this particular lesson, we're going to use the word bit to refer to states A and B to be consistent with the activity. Now, we're gonna up our challenge. Challenge two is four possible messages. Not all, quest all questions have only two possible answers. Your new challenge is to invent a way to use your device to send an answer to a question that has four possible answers. Think about these things. Should you modify your device? Should you use it in a different way? Should you make it a new device, ent device entirely? How are you going to do it? Now, virtually you'll be working with your same partner. Be prepared to share out your device and how it works at the end of the five minutes. What have you come up with? Well, here's just one example that I took from the first year that I taught this course. Um, somebody came up with what flavor of ice cream do you like? Chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, or cookie dough? The device description was a simple colored three by five index card that was purple on one side and green on the other. If you wanted chocolate, you showed the horizontal purple side. If you wanted vanilla, it was a vertical purple side. Strawberry was horizontal green and cookie dough was vertical green. So here, one device, and made it into four different states. Hmm. Now, whoops. So, before I would go on, I would want to hear what everybody else did. Okay, so at this point, again, would have been asking everybody for their ideas. As you can tell here, in my binary version, if I were to use a colored card, I would probably just either turn it to the purple side for one answer, green side for the other. Here, I'm using the fact that it's a three by five index card, so I can go horizontal or vertical, horizontal or vertical. Now the catch here is, you gotta remember what all four of those things mean. The next challenge, eight possible messages. What if you wanted to ask an even more complex question with eight possible answers? Just as before, update your device and test it out. Record how to use your device. You'll have five minutes. If you're doing this all by yourself, think about it. Come up with something. And again, you could use paper clips, a piece of paper. You can't write words on it, but it could be red on one side, blue on the other side, things like that. A string, a cup. This cup can go up or down, right? Um, any kind of just inanimate object. You cannot throw projectiles and you can't use words. So go. Pause the video for these five minutes. Okay, 
you're back. What did you come up with? Did you modify your device to add states? Like I did before. I went from just purple and green to purple vertical, purple horizontal, green vertical, green horizontal. Wouldn't really work that well now when I went to eight. I would have to think of something completely different. Did you not change the device, but just use it differently? If so, how was that use? How did you use it differently? And again, I'm going to go around and ask people in the virtual classroom. Now, this is leading us to N, not M possible, but N possible messages, meaning any arbitrary number of messages. Could we keep increasing the number of messages forever? Could our devices be used for questions with 16, 32, or a million possible responses? Some things to think about. Our alphabet only has 26 letters, but we can spell many, many words. Our number system only has 10 digits, 0 through 9, and yet we can represent an infinite number of values. Think back to your original two-state device. Could you simply use it differently rather than modifying it? Think. How could you use your device to respond to much more complex questions, for example, one with a thousand possible responses? Pause the video. Think about that. Take a few minutes to come up with a system for using your device and describe it in such a way that another group could pick up your device and use it to send messages. Now remember that in order for somebody else to pick it up and use it, it's going to have to be simple. So pause the video and think. You back? Fantastic. Okay, I would go around and hear different people's machines. Then I would ask, could you use another group's machine to send your message? Why or why not? The answer to this should be yes. All of your devices, if you followed the rules correctly, should be interchangeable because they all have ways to represent binary states. To use another group's devices, you would need to know how to use the device to signal each state, A or B, on or off. You would need some kind of a guide or instructions explaining how many states per message and what each unique sequence means. For example, each message is a sequence of five binary, A, 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 Alaska, A, 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 B, Alabama, etc. Now, the purpose of these activities was to build toward an understanding that from an engineering perspective, the simplest way to physically send an infinite number of messages over some distance is to make a binary message device and to send unique sequences of binary states. So when you want four different things, you're gonna send two different binary states. It's how the internet at the physical level actually works. How exactly does binary code work? We're going to watch and learn. This is a TED Talk, and I'm not going to bring it up here, but you should watch it when you finish this, close this lesson out, click on the TED Talk. It will be listed in the Canvas as the next thing to do. And then that's it for today.